Hello students, I am Jnaneshwara TN, Assistant Professor of English. In this session, I am going to introduce a poem, Death the Leveller, written by James Shirley. Death the Leveller is an epigrammatic poem written by English poet and dramatist James Shirley. The poem was originally included in James Shirley's interlude, The Contention of Ajax and Ulysses, as Calcha's hymn at the funeral of Ajax. This poem centers on the egalitarian nature of death. In this poem, Shirley's thoughts revolve around the ideas of the transience of worldly glory and the inevitability of death. Death gives the ultimate ruling over a man's life. No one can escape from the hands of death. Death treats everyone similarly. When one dies, no matter how great he is, has to reside in the cold chamber grave. Death does not give importance to one's wealth, achievement, position and status. It turns worldly glory to the dust. According to Shirley, in order to get out of the cold clutches of death, one has to do things that matter to humankind. The contention of Ajax and Ulysses for the armor of Achilles, an interlude written by James Shirley, is a Carolyn era stage play which was first published in 1659. The play's second scene is devoted to Ajax's madness. Ajax has lost his mind as a result of his defeat to Ulysses and eventually commits suicide. The brief final scene shows Ajax's funeral. While not one of Shirley's most famous works, the contention contains a funeral dirge that begins, The glories of our blood and state are shadows, not substantial things, which has been often excerpted and reproduced, sometimes under the title of Death the Leveller. Included in collections of familiar quotations, the poem is the most famous and popular work in Shirley's canon. James Shirley was a respected poet, playwright, who survived many upheavals in his lifetime. A personal religious conversion to Catholicism, the English Civil War, the Puritans and Oliver Cromwell, outbreaks of the plague and exile in Ireland. Born in London in 1596, after a good education, he took holy orders in 1620. In 1625, he converted to Catholicism and had to resign his headmaster's post in St. Albans Grammar School. In order to earn a living for himself and his wife, he returned to the theatre and began writing plays. Most of his plays were performed by Queen Henrietta's men, the playing company for which Shirley served as house dramatist. In 1636, he went to Dublin, where he wrote for the Werberg Street Theatre, reputed to be the first theatre in Ireland. In 1640, he returned to London and found that, in his absence, Queen Henrietta's men had sold off a dozen of his plays to the stationers who published them in the late 1630s. As a result, he would no longer work for Queen Henrietta's company and the final plays of his London career were acted by the King's men. In 1642, his career as a playwright was stopped by the London theatre closure. By 1642, when Cromwell closed all the theatres in England, Shirley had written 36 plays.
His plays were witty and satirical. His work was influenced by the work of Fletcher and Beaumont. In his lifetime, he had a good reputation as a dramatist while his poetry was less known. Shirley, aged 70, and his second wife died of fright and exposure after the Great Fire of London in 1666. Let us read and understand the poem. There are three stanzas in this poem. The glories of our blood and state are shadows, not substantial things. The poet says that our birth, whether higher or lower, and status are not important things because there is no armor against fate. Death lays his icy hand on kings. Scepter and crown must tumble down and in the dust be equal made with the poor group scythe and spade. The poet says that nothing can protect us against death. Death lays his icy hands even on kings. Here the poet has used scepter and crown as metonymy for kings. He says that they must tumble down and they will be made equal with scythe and spade of farmers in the end. Kings and farmers are equal in the face of death. Some men with swords may reap the field and plant fresh laurels where they kill. The poet says that some men may kill people and put symbols of victory in the places which they conquer. But their strong nerves at last must yield. At last they must yield to death. They tame but one another still, early or late. They stoop to fate and must give up their murmuring breath when they pale captives creep to death. Early or late, they must stoop to death and give up their breath as pale captives crawling to death. The garlands wither on your brow, then boast no more your mighty deeds. Upon death's purple altar now, see where the victor victim bleeds. The poet says that when you die, the garlands will become dry soon and no longer you can boast of your achievements. Upon the death's altar, even the victorious man becomes victim. Your heads must come to the cold tomb. The poet says that you must come to the cold tomb. Only the actions of the just smell sweet and blossom in their dust. In the last two lines, the poet tells that only the good actions will smell sweet and blossom in the dust. Only the good work of man will bring him fame. Men will be remembered for their good work, but not for killing others, because even the killer must die one day. Let us discuss the themes and literary devices employed in the poem. Let us discuss the themes of the poem. The point that Shirley stresses again and again in this poem is that man is mortal. Man cannot escape from the death. There is no armor against fate. The poet stresses the inevitability of death. Man's noble deeds are the only way to escape from mortality. A man can become immortal by doing 
good works. Another theme is equality. Death treats everyone equally. He does not discriminate between kings and farmers. Death lays his icy hands even on kings. Their scepter and crown must tumble down. They will be made equal with scythe and spade of farmers in the end. Next theme is actions of the just. Actions of the just are like flowers which smell sweet and blossom even in the dust. Shirley says that glories and achievements of man do not last long. Only the noble deeds remain after his death. James Shirley has given an apt title for this poem. Death makes everyone equal eventually. Kings and farmers will be made equal in the death. Victor becomes a victim in the face of death. That is why the poet calls death a leveler. If we consider the style of the poem, the overall poem is written in the form of an epigram. Regarding the speaker, it is written from the third person point of view. Death is personified in this poem. When we come to the tone of the poem, there is a pessimistic tone in the first stanza. In the second stanza, the tone subtly changes from one of valiant victory in the battle to that of piteous surrender to death. Only in the last two lines of the poem is there a tone of hope and optimism when the poet asserts that man's good deeds will never die. Now let us see the structure and form of the poem. There are three stanzas in the poem. Each stanza contains eight rhyming lines. The rhyme scheme of the poem is A, B, A, B, C, C, D, D. It means the first four lines contain the alternative rhyme scheme and the rest of the lines form two rhyming couplets. This scheme is followed throughout the poem. The overall poem is composed in iambic tetrameter and iambic dimeter. Let us examine the figures of speech employed in the poem. Shirley has used metaphor, metonymy, oxymoron, synecdoche, personification and alliteration. In a metaphor, one kind of thing is applied to a distinctly different kind of thing without asserting a comparison. The examples from the poem are The glories of our blood and state are shadows. Some men with swords may reap the field and plant fresh laurels where they kill. Only the actions of the just smell sweet and blossom in their dust. In metonymy, the literal term for one thing is applied to another with which it has become closely associated because of a recurrent relation in common experience. Examples from the poem are scepter and crown, scythe and spade. If the paradoxical utterance conjoins two terms that in ordinary usage are contraries, it is called an oxymoron. Oxymoron used in the poem is Victor Victim. In synecdoche, a part of something is used to signify the whole or the whole is used to signify a part. Examples from the poem are, but the strong nerves at last must yield. Next one is, your heads must come to the cold tomb. In personification, either an inanimate object or an abstract concept is spoken of as though it were endowed with life or with human attributes or feelings. 
For example, death lays his icy hand on kings. Death is personified here. Alliteration is the repetition of a speech sound in a sequence of nearby words. Examples from the poem are Scythe and Spade, Victor Victim, Smell Sweet. Thank you for watching this video till the end. Have a nice day.